Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the third and final webinar developed by Scottish Government Building Standards Division uh, and the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. These webinars have been designed to support a three-month targeted consultation of a draft Scottish advice note uh, to determine the fire risk posed by external wall systems in existing multi-storey residential buildings. My name is Sam Hart. I'm an Innovation Manager at the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. I'm delighted to be joined today by uh, Gavin Gray and Colin Hurd from the Scottish Government. Gavin and Colin are both currently leading on this Scottish advice note on external wall cladding systems and considering the recommendations of the Grenfell Inquiry Phase 1 report. Before I get underway, I'd just like to highlight some housekeeping points to help keep the webinar running as smoothly as possible. Firstly, the session is being recorded today and the presentations uh, will be available in the weeks following today. All participants are on mute for the duration of the webinar, but I do encourage you to please ask questions throughout. To do so, click questions in the control panel, type in your question and press send. We'll try to answer as many as we can during the Q&A session. Your feedback and, opinion, and opinions are extremely important to us. So we will know each and every question, and if we don't have time to answer them all today, we will endeavour to incorporate them into future presentations in the series. We'll have some interactive polls displayed on your screen in between each of the segments today. Please answer them and we can display the results for everyone to see during the webinar. This will also help inform the direction of travel for the project. And finally, we will be sharing videos during today's webinar. Uh, if you're struggling to hear any of these, please check your audio options in settings on the computer and not phone. If you have a monitor plugged into your laptop, you might need to disconnect the second screen in order to activate the, the volume. So I appreciate some of you may not be aware of what we do at the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre and therefore wanted to take a couple of minutes to outline the work we do and how the collaboration with the Building Standards Division was established. Okay. So CSIC firmly believe that innovation is about change that unlocks value. However, that value doesn't have to be financial. It could be achieved by reducing waste, by increasing productivity, or simply changing standard practices across the sector. Drive cultural change through procurement reform, a more collaborative approach with earlier contractor involvement and better training. Sounds like something quoted from one of the recent construction industry quality reports. It was in fact from the Simon Report, published in 1944, written over 75 years ago, just a year before the end of the Second World War. Clearly challenges for the sector rem remain, and we are working hard to ensure innovation is incorporated wherever possible to overcome these long-standing issues. So by way of some background, CSIC are funded by the Scottish Government through the Scottish Funding Council, Scottish Enterprise, and Highland and Island Enterprise, and are one of seven in a family of innovation centres, all with a key objective, to connect their respective industries to the brightest minds and the biggest projects to bring transformational change across the sectors. Our, ac our academic partners include all Scottish universities and colleges. And this slide shows some of the highlights and impacts that CSIC has achieved today, including key forecasts such as 1.09 billion additional revenue 4,000 safeguarded and 5,000 new jobs created. So as we move to phase two in May, we identified four industry priorities aligned to zero carbon outcomes. Digital transformation, accelerating industrialization, building sustainably and culture change. To do this, we have four core activities. Connected ecosystems, essentially assuring that everyone is communicating with each other, exactly what an event like today is all about. Collaborative projects, bringing industry, academia and the public sector together to create transformational change across the construction sector. Future skills, addressing the identified skills gap through bespoke projects to support students through their qualifications, upskilling existing workers to ensure their skills remain relevant and training the trainers to build capacity in the UK education and skills system and ensure colleges, universities, and training providers are well-placed to respond to the growing UK construction industry. And last but not least, the innovation factory, 
the UK construction industry's first dedicated digital manufacturing, prototyping and future skills centre of excellence. And rest assured, it doesn't look quite as tidy as that today. Some of our recent work, which aligns with today's webinar, includes a large fire and use project in collaboration with the Structural Timber Association and the University of Edinburgh, with full-scale fire testing certified by the UK's leading fire expertise. The guidance and pattern book approach is a UK first. The project has particular re relevance given, the, given that approximately 85% of Scotland's homes are built using timber. Further work includes my own secondment across, across to Scottish Government to develop a compliance plan approach to construction projects on behalf of the Building Standards Futures Board, set up to provide guidance and direction for the recommendations made by the review panels formed by the Ministerial Working Group on Building and Fire Safety. I do therefore have some experience in this arena, but I am keen to hand over to our expert panellists to give you some detailed information on today's topic of external wall cladding systems. However, before we do, I'd like to take the opportunity to ask you all a question. So can we have our first poll, please? So have you read the draft Scottish advice? No, yes, no, or some of it. Okay, so 33% uh, have read it, 44, 47% apologies haven't read it, uh, and 20% have read some of it. So there's there's some knowledge um, in the audience so far, but obviously we've got our expert panelists here today to to give us further information. Um, so that's enough from me. Let's move on to some more technical information around the Scottish Advice Note from our first panelist, Gavin Gray. Gavin is a serving station commander in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. He has many years experience as a fire safety enforcement officer and is deputy head of fire safety enforcement. In 2005, he was seconded to the Scottish Government to assist with the introduction of new fire safety le legislation apologies and supporting guidance. For the last 18 months, he has once again been working on secondment to assist in implementing recommendations made in light of the Grenfell Tower tragedy. This included the production of fire safety guidance for those responsible for fire safety in high-rise domestic buildings and fire safety leaflets, which were issued to all high-rise residents in late 2019, early 2020. He was also responsible for producing fire safety guidance for specialized housing, which was published in January 2020. Gavin pre-recorded his ele element of the webinar. So could we start his presentation, please? Hello and thanks for joining me for this presentation on the Scottish Advice Note. We're here today because we want your views on new draft government guidance. So I'd urge you to read the Scottish Advice Note if you've not done so already and then complete the consultation questionnaire which is on the Scottish Government website. That's the same web page that has the webinar links and the address is on the title slide just now. Today's webinar will give you an overview of the guidance and the principles which underpin it. As you know, the Scottish Advice Note, let's call it the SAN for short, is fire safety guidance for external wall systems, including cladding. It's aimed mainly at building owners and others who are responsible for fire safety in multi-storey residential buildings, and it will help them determine the fire risk associated with external wall systems. So why do we need this guidance? Well, to answer that, we really need to look at the background to its development. After the Grenfell Tower fire in 2017, the Scottish Government immediately established a ministerial working group, which oversaw three reviews of building and fire safety to help ensure that people are safe in Scotland's buildings. Two reviews looked into the building standards regime which applies to new building work. And the other looked into the fire safety regime, which applies to existing high-rise domestic buildings. So one building standards review focused on the fire section of the technical handbook guidance. That's guidance for compliance with building regulations. The review made recommendations which led to changes in requirements for cladding systems and other fire safety measures. Another review looked at compliance and enforcement 
of building standards. And many of its recommendations are being taken forward by a newly established Futures Board. The third review on the fire safety regime found no major gaps in legislation, but it did make six recommendations, which have since been delivered such as new fire safety guidance for high-rise domestic buildings and a fire safety leaflet which was delivered to every high-rise home in Scotland. Also, an inventory of high-rise domestic buildings in Scotland was compiled to better understand the fire safety situation and to use as a basis for further improvement. And next year, housing legislation will make it a legal requirement for all homes in Scotland to have interconnected smoke and heat alarms, irrespective of tenure. All of this has been about strengthening fire safety in Scotland. So that's good to know, but it doesn't really explain why we need more guidance. Well, after Grenfell, the UK government launched a building safety programme and established an independent expert panel on fire safety. They also commissioned a series of fire tests for cladding and fire doors which led to the expert panel publishing fire safety advice notes. These notes were eventually consolidated into a single document with the title Advice for Building Owners of Multi-Story Multi-Occupied Residential Buildings, known as the Consolidated Guidance for short. This was published in January earlier this year and it deals mainly with the fire performance of cladding but also covers fire doors, smoke control and other aspects of construction. It's for building owners and managers to help them manage risk, but it has no legal status in Scotland and doesn't replace our standards or guidance. But the consolidated guidance has had an impact on the UK mortgage lending industry. Lenders were already nervous about the fire risk from cladding after Grenfell, and the consolidated guidance seems to have just spooked them even more. Some high-rise flats are getting zero valuations if the building has cladding on it. To try to break the deadlock, a new form was developed for high-rise buildings, known as an EWS-1 form, which should be completed by a specialist who's assessed the cladding. However, this hasn't resolved the problem, and there's reports of lower-rise buildings with cladding also being affected. It's a problem that's affecting the whole of the UK. So you might ask, don't we already have guidance for existing buildings in Scotland? Well, yes, we do. We have guidance and it does advise that fire safety risk assessments should consider fire spread on external walls. But this is a very technical subject and that part of the guidance is very brief. For years, most fire risk assessors just assumed if it's passed the building standards process, it should be fine. However, we now know that's not necessarily the case for a number of reasons, which we'll talk about later. So in light of the consolidated guidance, Scottish ministers decided that we should produce our own version, given we have quite different building standards and fire safety regimes in Scotland. And so a technical working group was established to develop a Scottish advice note, or SAN. The groups met three times and were on version three of the draft SAN. So the SAN is now subject to a three-month targeted consultation, as I say, which closes on the 25th of October. And as I said at the start, we want to hear your views, so please take time to read it if you've not done so already, and please complete the consultation questionnaire to help us improve it and to avoid any unintended consequences. There's only 10 questions, so it shouldn't take too long to complete. We really want to know if the games is helpful. Is it clear? Is it missing anything? And do you agree or disagree with the content? The aim of the SAN is to ensure that external wall systems don't compromise the safety of occupants in the event of a fire. It's that straightforward. However, the actual process of assessing and determining fire risk can be quite technical. And so the guidance by its very nature can't avoid being technical in places. In fact, there'd be something wrong if it wasn't. But rather than getting too bogged down in detail at this stage, I plan to give you a quick overview of the draft guidance. But before we do, I think it's worth highlighting the four key issues which were the focus of our working group meetings. And these key issues really establish the framework of the guidance. So firstly, the range of premises within scope. Should it mirror the English consolidated guidance or be different? 
In the end, it was decided to mirror the English guidance to avoid having any gaps. Secondly, it should be risk-based. That was the clear consensus of the technical working group. So the role of the fire risk assessor and other supporting specialists formed a big part of our discussions. Also, competence, a key theme from Dame Judith Hackett's review of building regulations and fire safety. And it's something that's been taken forward by the industry response group. But competence was also a key consideration in drafting the SAN. And of course, benchmarks. All risk-based guidance contains benchmarks for assessors to compare existing provision against, which helps them to evaluate the risk. So with those in mind, let's take a look at the content of the SAN, and we'll explore these key issues as we go. The SAN is split into three parts. Part one, the introduction. Part two, external wall systems. And part three covers interim measures where unsafe cladding or external wall systems have been identified. Section 1.1 explains that the purpose of the SAN is to assist building owners and managers determine the fire risk posed by external wall systems. It's aimed at them because at the end of the day they're responsible, but of course only competent risk assessors should as undertake the fire safety risk assessment, so it will be of great interest to them and to any other experts whose services may also be required, such as surveyors or engineers. The guidance covers cladding systems, spandrel panels, window infill panels, balconies, solar shading, and any other architectural feature or attachment to the external building structure. In the SAN, we describe these collectively as external wall systems, and the guidance will help identify any unsafe systems which require remedial action. Section 1.2 covers the scope. So, as we said before, it applies to existing multi-storey residential buildings, basically anywhere with sleeping accommodation, like domestic blocks of flats, student accommodation, including halls of residence, hospitals, or other premises with overnight patient accommodation, care homes, hotels, and hostels. The scope also makes it clear that the SAN is about life safety, we don't cover property protection or business continuity. Also, the SAN contains links to existing fire safety guidance for information on fire doors and smoke control. So its focus is squarely on external wall systems. Then there's sections on the fire safety and building standards regimes in Scotland. In 1.6, the role of benchmarks are explained, which I'll cover in more detail shortly. Section 1.7 explains how fire safety risk assessments should cover all fire hazards and risks, including external wall systems, and then goes on to say that more detailed appraisals by specialists may be, may be required in some cases to inform the risk assessment, but I'll come back to this later. Section 1.8 covers competence. The SAN offers information on how to find competent fire risk assessors and other specialists, such as chartered surveyors and fire engineers. As a rule, nobody should undertake work they're not competent to do. For instance, some risk assessors may be competent to only assess certain buildings. Some will limit themselves to simple lower risk buildings and won't assess higher risk or more complex buildings. And some may not be competent to assess certain aspects of construction, such as buildings with fire engineered designs or external wall systems. The building owner or manager needs to know that whoever undertakes the risk assessment is competent to do so for their building. If a risk assessor has doubts over the safety of an external wall system and is competent, it's likely that further investigation by a specialist surveyor or engineer may be required. This can also be the case for other aspects of construction, such as an assessor may recommend a structural survey of voids and ducts in older buildings. Section 1.9 covers documentation that may be available to help a risk assessor to determine whether an external wall system is safe or if a more detailed appraisal is required. Section 1.10 describes the more common types of external wall cladding, such as MCM, which stands for Metal Composite Material, and HPL, High Pressure Laminate. Section 1.11 explains how British Standard 8414 large-scale fire tests and related test criteria 
in BR135 can be an alternative route to compliance under Scottish building regulations and how these tests have been used to determine the fire performance of different systems. Finally, part one rounds off with some fire statistics, just to give some context to the scale of the issue in residential buildings. So part two looks in more detail at different types of external wall systems and offers benchmarks and guidance which should help to determine the level of fire risk. MCM category three is highlighted as being particularly dangerous and the guidance recommends that it's removed from extensively clad buildings and offers a framework to assess the risk from partially clad buildings. And this is regardless of height. Then in line with technical handbook criteria, we've split the guidance according to building height, those 11 metres or over, and those under 11 metres. The remainder of part two considers other features such as spandrel panels, balconies, other attachments, and green walls. Part three then covers the interim actions to be taken and measures to be put in place where unsafe cladding has been identified. These are short-term fixes until the system can be properly remediated. So hopefully that gives you a feel for what's in the guidance. Let's now pick up on some of the key themes that I said I'd come back to. I mentioned the role of the fire safety risk assessment a few times now but it's maybe worth a bit more discussion to cover the linkages between the risk assessor and other specialists. So by its nature, the assessment is a wide ranging exercise and the fire risk assessor frequently relies on specialists to undertake specific assessments and provide reports, which then inform the overall fire safety risk assessment. So we have some examples here, such as gas and electrical safety. Qualified gas engineers and electricians carry out inspections and servicing. But fire risk assessors need to review those reports as part of the fire safety risk assessments. Structural reports by surveyors might be required to identify hidden voids and ducts in older buildings, which could lead to hidden and rapid fire spread. If a report is available, it will be reviewed by the risk assessor, or possibly recommended by the assessor if deemed necessary uh, and it hasn't been carried out. If fire engineered solutions underpin the design of the building, then risk assessors would have to ensure the risk assessments took this into account. Fire alarm servicing and maintenance, again, usually carried out by specialist engineers in line with British standard recommendations. The reports are reviewed by risk assessors. Similarly, for external wall systems, risk assessors should review any detailed appraisal reports if they're available or consider whether a detailed appraisal by a surveyor or fire engineer is required. So let's now take a closer look at what the guidance has got to say. But first, just a few words about using the benchmarks. They're used by risk assessors to help them make judgments about risk. It gives them something to compare existing provision against. For external wall systems, the benchmarks are derived from building standards guidance. But the risk assessor should also take account of the UK government's fire test results, which are reproduced in the SAN. The important point to bear in mind is that the benchmarks aren't prescriptive standards. They're comparators, which need to be used flexibly. It's fair to say, though, that significant deviations from the benchmarks will involve greater risk, so are more likely to require remediation, whereas minor deviations may not but it's a judgment that needs to be made by a suitably qualified professional. Our guidance for MCM Category 3 is a bit different to the rest of the guidance. It's deemed to be so dangerous that we're advising it should be removed as soon as possible, regardless of building height. No benchmarks needed to make a judgment, at least for buildings which are extensively clad in it. As I said, MCM stands for metal composite material, usually aluminium, zinc or copper, and Category 3 is the most combustible. Grenfell Tower had ACM Category 3, an aluminium panel with an unmodified polyethylene core, which has since failed a large-scale fire test. Thankfully, very few buildings in Scotland are thought to be extensively clad in MCM Category 3. For buildings that are partially clad with MCM Category 3, a more detailed risk assessments required. 
and the sand has examples of where cladding may need to be removed. For example, where it crosses fire separation lines or cavity barriers, if it's located near entrances and exits, or where falling debris could pose a risk, or near ground level where it could be potentially ignited by an external source. The SAN also highlights other factors such as the distance between the panels, the position and the extent of the panels, concerns over installation and so on. So that's MCM Category 3 guidance which applies regardless of height. As I said earlier, for the rest we've split the guidance into two, buildings that are 11 metres or over and buildings under 11 metres. Splitting it like this follows the approach taken in the technical handbooks. The 11 metre threshold comes from the reach of a fire service ground mounted water jet assuming adequate pressure and flow in the water main and also external rescue above this height is more difficult and requires specialist height appliances and adequate site access for them. Therefore more stringent requirements apply over 11 metres. This is where the benchmarks need to be used flexibly and it's important to consider the results of the UK government fire tests here too. It's possible for some buildings to fall short of the benchmark without actually posing an unacceptable risk. It depends on a, a large range of factors, including how far off the benchmark the system is. So each risk assessment needs to be building specific. And the key question must always be whether the external wall system poses a significant risk to life. So for buildings of 11 metres or over, the benchmark is European classification A1 or A2 which is either non-combustible or very limited combustibility. As I said before, the technical handbooks allow for an alternative method of compliance. So a system which has undergone a large-scale fire test and met certain performance criteria may be acceptable. Of course, it's likely that some systems on existing buildings won't meet this benchmark. It may be Class B, or even maybe Class O, which relates only to the surface spread of flame. These may or may not be safe. Further information is required to make a determination. The combustibility of the core filler materials, which are sandwiched between the panel surfaces, may contribute to fire spread. Class B may be acceptable if the core filler material and the insulation behind the, the panel achieves Class A2 or better, but this should be subject to advice from a competent specialist and supported by test evidence. The SAN includes information on large-scale fire test results for different types of MCM and HPL systems. But I'm not going to say any more on this, as Colin will cover this in his presentation. But what I will say is that it's important to consider the results of these tests if the system on the building doesn't meet the benchmark. For buildings under 11 metres, then, the technical handbooks allow more combustible forms of cladding, such as Class B, C, D, or even E as long as they're not too close to an adjacent building. Even though the risk may be lower for buildings under 11 metres, they still need to be considered in the risk assessment. Remember, the 11 metre threshold is based on fire service operations. But even in buildings under 11 metres, access for fire service vehicles may be challenging, and the, way, the mains water pressure could be poor. Not only that, future changes could also impact on risk, so it should be a guiding principle of the risk assessment that occupants can escape safely without an over-reliance on fire service intervention. Also, some buildings under 11 metres could be higher risk if the occupants are likely to be vulnerable, which is why current building regulation guidance requires most new hospitals, care homes and places of entertainment and assembly to meet the same high standard that applies to buildings of 11 metres or over. So we've considered the guidance and benchmarks which relate to fire performance, but what other factors should be considered when determining the risk posed by external wall systems? Well, as I've just said, occupant characteristics, such as the vulnerability of residents, is an important factor, including their ability to recognise danger, to respond appropriately and, of course, to evacuate which will be very different in different types of premises, for example, in a care home compared to student accommodation. The evacuation strategy and likely evacuation times will have a bearing, whether it's simultaneous evacuation, progressive horizontal or stay put, which again will vary widely depending on the type of premises. The premises emergency plan should be considered and 
Again, depending on the type of building, it may place requirements on staffing levels and training. We've already discussed how fire performance is a key risk factor, which depends on the combustibility of the cladding, but it also will be dependent on how it's fixed to the external wall and cavity barrier provision. The quality of construction, the standard of workmanship and the presence of any building defects needs to be considered. Combustibility of other aspects of the building structure and the potential for structural fire spread also needs consideration. And the risk assessment needs to consider if there could be exposure to external fires such as bin room fires, skip fires or car fires. And of course the height, the use and the complexity of different buildings will vary significantly and can affect risk. Internal fire protection measures in the building, for example fire separation, suppression and fire detection will impact on risk. And the location and number of escape routes is clearly a factor. The suitability of firefighting facilities including site access and water supplies will also impact on risk. So all these factors will have a bearing on the risk posed by external wall systems. I've said several times now that the risk assessor may need to be supported by specialist wall appraisals, but under what circumstances do all buildings need to undergo an expensive and intrusive detailed inspection as well as a fire safety risk assessment? To answer this we need to go back to first principles. The building standards system requires building developers to comply with building regulations. The regulations contain mandatory requirements, including in relation to external fire spread. The standard states that every building must be designed and constructed in such a way that in the event of an outbreak of fire within the building or from an external source, the spread of fire on the external walls of the building is inhibited. The technical handbooks then provide guidance on combustibility requirements to meet the intent of the regulations. So developers are responsible for compliance with the regulations, but they're also subject to verification by local authority verifiers, local building standards teams. So if they're verified as compliant, not all buildings might require a full intrusive appraisal any more than they would need a detailed check of any other safety critical aspects of their construction. So the SAN suggests the following approach. The fire risk assessor should review the available documentation relating to the external wall system and may conclude that it's unlikely to pose a significant risk to life and that a full appraisal is therefore unlikely to be necessary. But where the risk assessor has doubts or is unable to conclude the system safe, or feels unable to offer appropriate remedial advice, then a suitably competent specialist, such as a chartered fire engineer or surveyor, is likely to be required to undertake a full detailed appraisal. So what specifically might raise alarm bells and prompt a specialist wall appraisal? Well, if the type of cladding or insulation is unknown, then an appraisal will be required to identify what it is and its fire performance characteristics. If there's a lack of supporting records or gaps in documentation, then an appraisal could be required. Where there's evidence of systemic problems with a particular product or a manufacturer or installer even, then more intrusive investigations likely to be necessary. If there's doubts over whether the system is built to spec, does it reflect the system as originally designed and tested? Are there grounds to suspect there may have been product substitution? Again, an intrusive inspection and an appraisal by a specialist is likely to be required. Test evidence can be a trigger. If the system's failed a large-scale fire test, or the test evidence shows an overprovision of cavity barriers, or if the risk assessor has doubts over whether large-scale testing is even appropriate for the type of premises in question, and doubts about the independence of the testing facility may also trigger an appraisal. These are the sorts of things that might lead to a full external wall appraisal by a specialist surveyor or fire engineer. Key principles to summarise then. Fire performance is a key factor to consider in the risk assessment, but it's not the only factor. 
There's also the need to consider the height and the use and the complexity of the building, the occupant characteristics, the evacuation strategy, the quality of construction, of course, as well as other fire safety measures provided in the building. Appraisals by specialists might be required to inform the fire safety risk assessment if there's doubts over the safety of the external wall system. So the specialist who undertakes the appraisal also needs to be a competent fire risk assessor to ensure that the full range of risk factors are considered in relation to the external wall system. If the appraisal specialist is not able to do this, then a suitably competent fire risk assessor needs to make sure that the appraisal report informs their risk assessment. Not all risk assessors will be able to do this, of course, but it's important, really important, that building owners and others ensure that only people that are competent to make the judgments are allowed to do so. So that completes the overview of the Scottish Advice Note. What are the next steps then? Well, the three-month targeted consultation ends on the 25th of October. We've arranged three webinars in total and a number of meetings with key stakeholders, including residence groups. We then plan to recall the technical working group to consider all the feedback and to agree a final version for publication, hopefully around November time. And of course, we'll monitor and evaluate the impact of the guidance after publication and improve it further if required. So hopefully that was useful and set the scene for you. Colin will now demystify some of the testing and performance aspects that I've talked about, including the results from the large-scale fire testing that took place after Grenfell. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you. There's always one, isn't there? Uh, <laughs> a very informative and comprehensive presentation. Thanks, Gavin. Um, next, we have some more audience participation. So could we have the second poll, please? OK, risk assessments should have a consideration of external wall systems, but how many buildings require a full intrusive appraisal? Most, about half, few, don't know. Okay, so 13% for most, uh, very closely 15%, um, about half. I think majority, nearly half of people think uh, a few and around a quarter aren't sure. So we'll incorporate those into, into the previous webinar results and, and we'll get an average um, and obviously we'll get, this, um, we'll get these presented uh, following this webinar. Um, our next presentation focuses on fire testing and performance of external wall cladding systems and will be delivered by Colin Hurd. Colin joined the Scottish Government in 2001 in his role as Head of Fire, Structure and Environment within the Building Standards Division. Colin led technical reviews on structural fire precautions, escape, fire and rescue service facilities, automatic fire suppression systems and structural euro codes. Colin represents the government on various technical committees and steering groups and advises Scottish ministers on all aspects of design and construction relating to fire, structure and environment. He is currently assisting the Scottish government in their response to the Grenfell Tower fire, including introduction of the new standards and guidance in section two fire of the technical handbooks that came into force on the 1st of October 2019. Colin has also pre-recorded his element of the webinar, so could we start his presentation please? Good morning, my name is Colin Hurd. I head up the fire structure and environment team at the Building Standards Division in the Scottish Government. This morning I'm going to talk to you about fire testing and the performance of external wall cladding systems. And as Gavin says, I'll attempt to try and demystify some of the jargon. I think it's important that I do a little bit of scene setting at the beginning in terms of Scottish fire statistics. 
I'm then going to talk in a little bit more detail in the large scale cladding system test. Uh, I'm then going to briefly go over uh, some of the reaction to fire classifications uh, and tests associated with the harmonised European standards and some of the older British standards, because I'm conscious that there will be some buildings um, that, that will be that will have cladding materials, if you like, tested to older British standards. So in terms of context, I think it's really important to stress that less than 1% of accidental dwelling fires in multi-storey domestic buildings spread actually beyond the floor of origin. And since the statistics were transferred from the Home Office to the Scottish Government in the early 2000s, there has been no recorded fatalities beyond the dwelling of fire origin in Scotland. So when I first started in the Scottish Government in 2001, there was more than 8,000 accidental dwelling fires. And as you can see from the statistics, that resulted in 88 fatal casualties. Now that number is almost halved in less than two decades. Whilst those figures are, are welcome, obviously we're not complacent. And Grenfell is a stark reminder of what happens when things go badly wrong. Um, it's interesting, the statistics that the fires in domestic buildings, there's a lot less fires in obviously high rise domestic buildings, more than six storeys, um, which resulted in 49 casualties and one fatality in 2019-20. That represented, if you like, a reduction in less than 57% uh, in buildings of six or more storeys in the last decade. So that's, again, that's, that's quite a significant reduction. A lot of these reductions are primarily based on smoke alarms now being more prevalent in, in dwellings, but also community fire safety initiatives carried out by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. As you can see from this final slide on statistics, cooking appliances is still by far the highest um, cause of fire. And I'll not go through all those statistics, you, you can read them for yourselves, but Alcohol consumption is still a major contributory factor with, with fire casualties in, in Scotland. So moving on to the fire performance of external walls, the Scottish advice note uh, that Gavin introduced you to earlier refers to this document called BR135. It was first published in 1988 as a direct result of the proliferation and thermally insulated external wall cladding systems. There was no standard large scale fire test available at that time. Um, therefore, this was guidance only primarily targeted at architects, facade engineers, developers, etc. The test work behind the first edition um, was based on a large scale single faced wall. Now, the next slide I'm about to show you, if you visualise, to give, it, give it a bit of context to this performance criteria that we have in BR135, if you visualise this next slide as a multi story block of flats um, with all the walls and floors constructed completely of non-combustible material. In the right conditions, I'm just going to show you the, 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 the reasonable worst case scenario um, that, that underpins, if you like, BR135. So we have flat, we have the, the, the fire in the flat of origin, spreading along the ceiling, radiant heat down onto the other furnishings, flash over, it then can break through the window or through an open window to the flat above because of the window to window alignment and the same process continues where you have the radiant heat down at flash over etc. Now obviously that's in quick time so this could repeat up all the way up the building. What I've just shown here is a hypothetical obviously fire service arriving by the time it gets to the if you like the third flat. The previous flats if you like are burnt out and, and that was just damping down procedures. Um, so that gives you an idea of what can happen in a completely building constructed of non-combustible material and you can still get a vertical fire spread under the right ventilation conditions. So in 1991, we had the Nowsley Heights Liverpool fire. There was no casualties in this particular incident, thankfully. Um, but what it did do is it, it showed the contribution that the side wall or the wing wall contributed to the fire. This was investigated by the building research establishment and it was clear that the radiant heat back into the fire generated additional energy and the fire almost like creating its own vortex as well. So there was a need identified to introduce uh, 
a, a side wing, if you like, to the test methodology. And that was done through B, um, the Fire Note 9 um, that was published by the Building Research Establishment in July of 1999. Um, the next slide I'm about to show you is uh, a similar fire, but in Scotland, um, primarily involving the uh, infill panels, if you like, below the window. So, so window to window vertically aligned with infill panels below. And this was in uh, Irvine in Scotland in, in Garnock Court in 1999. So again, similar scenario, fire in the room of origin spread either through flash, flash over out onto the external, through the window on the external wall, bearing in mind very rare for that to happen with statistics. But what was significant about this fire is it spread up so rapidly up these um, external uh, window infill panels that by the time the fire service actually arrived, there was like s at least six, seven living rooms on fire, um, which was quite significant because I think the fire service were there within six minutes of the call, if you like. Um, so again, that was that was investigated by by the, the building research establishment, and again, all of this evidence, if you like, feeds into further reviews, if you like, of of the um, performance criteria, assessment criteria of BR135. And there's a picture of it in, in uh, real time. There was, a, unfortunately, there was one fatality in that particular incident, but not in the dwelling, in the dwelling of fire origin. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it was quite a significant uh, fire. So the test methodology was first cited in building regulations in March 2002. Um, as an alternative means, if you like, of compliance. The, this was the predecessor of what we now know as BS 8414. A further change was made to building regulations uh, on the 1st of May 2005, where external wall cladding and the insulation exposed in the cavity, if you like, immediately behind the cladding, on high-rise domestic buildings with a floor over 18 metres should be either non-combustible or meet the performance criteria in BR135 when tested in accordance with BS8414. At that same time, we also introduced uh, automatic fire suppression systems in all high-rise domestic buildings, uh, again with a floor over 18 metres. So following the tragedy of the Grenfell Tower fire, uh, the UK government embarked on a series of fire tests. Initially, they offered free screening tests to the whole of the UK based on the bomb calorimeter test. The purpose behind that test was really just to assess, if you like, the core material of this, the product. It's called aluminium composite material. Um, very thin panel. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. There was three categories that were identified. Um, Basically, category one with less than three megajoules per kilogram is almost uh, non-combustible, if you like. Um, and categories two and three, there's quite a range in the, the category two between greater than three and less than 35 megajoules per kilogram. And category three that was found on Grenfell, according to the phase one inquiry, um, was more than 35 megajoules per kilogram. So there's, there's three distinct categories, if you like, of aluminium composite material that was on that's on the market. Um, that was then followed up, if you like, by seven full-scale facade tests to be as eight for one for part one with a masonry substrate. So this is what aluminium composite material uh, looks like. Um, this one is a with the PE, the polyethylene filler, uh, unmodified, which is the category three that I just referred to earlier. It's got 0.5 millimetres aluminium on, the, on both faces, sandwiched by a core of, as I say, polyethylene material between about three and seven millimetres, so a very thin uh, product. So this slide shows you how the ACM cladding system uh, is mounted, if you like, on a masonry substrate. We have the insulation material exposed in the cavity here, um, the support rails, as you can see here and here, to the actual ACM, if you like, cladding panels themselves, 
uh, mounted in a vertical or it could be horizontal alignment uh, with with or without gaps etc so that all adds to the complication of the te testing what's been tested should be constructed on site that is very very important i'll talk about that a bit later what's not shown here is the cavity barriers that will also form part of this test and again they are critical to prevent vertical fire spread if you like up inside the cavity um, in between the, the rain stream cladding and the if you like the insulation and the masonry substrate so quite a little complicated diagram but it's very important how this is all put together in order to assess its overall performance in this post flashover if you like fire coming out of a, a window or a door opening so what products were actually tested in terms of the insulation that was exposed in the cavity behind the, the rain screen cladding the first product was stone wool insulation we also tested um, polyisocyanurate foam insulation in the cavity behind and phenolic foam was the third product tested so that was the insulation products exposed in the cavity behind the rain screen cladding so I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking to you about BS, the BS8414 test and the performance criteria in BR135. The three red lines that you see are very much indicative of the floors and the corresponding fire barriers behind um, the cladding system in the cavity to prevent that fire spread in the cavity. The, 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 the dots that you see are thermocouples, uh, which measures the temperature and at level one it's 2.5 meters above the combustion chamber and a further 2.5 meters uh, at level two so basically level two is five meters above the actual combustion chamber opening itself and the combustion chamber simulates if you like a window or a door opening and if you remember back to the reference scenario what we were talking about was three flats in an uncombustible building with the window alignment so if i call that level one sorry flat one flat two flat three and after ignition as you would expect the fire will spread vertically and basically when the fire spreads and reaches level one at 200 degrees c that is when the clock event will start for the performance criteria to be measured if the fire continues up beyond to level two let's call it in flat three um, if the thermocouples reach 600 degrees c within 15 minutes of the start time of the test then that is a failure criteria clearly if the fire continues above the top of the test rig then that is also an early termination criteria one thing i do want to stipulate here which is quite important is the and i'm going to change color if fire barriers on the test rig are located say at this level below the thermocouples and protecting to a certain extent the thermocouples then that is exactly what should be constructed on site bs8414 has recently been revised to tighten up on the whole question round about what has been tested in the laboratory conditions actually appears on site so to summarize the failure criteria is if the, the, the flames go off the top of the test rig within the first 30 minutes of the test and we have a start time of 200 degrees c at the first row of thermocouples and a finish time of if if the thermocouples do not exceed 600 degrees c within 15 minutes of the start time then that that is a pass if it exceeds 600 clearly it's a fail um, So this slide shows the two of the UK government fire tests that were carried out post Grenfell. Test one was actually the, the same materials that was on Grenfell itself. 
um, the, with the aluminium composite material with the polyethylene unmodified core, if you like. And the second test shows the A2, if you like, ACM material, which is nearly non-combustible with a, a stone wool insulation exposed in the cavity behind. I realise that the pictures are slightly counterintuitive because it doesn't show a lot of fire damage on the left hand side of the screen, but it shows quite extensive fire damage on the right. But just to explain to you that when the test, you can see here from the crib that there's not a lot of the crib involved in the actual fire. And that is because obviously the fire spread vertically and bypassed, if you like, the, an awful lot of the, uh, the cavity wasn't particularly involved in the fire in this particular test. And the fire bypassed a lot of the cavity barriers behind the cladding, went off at the top of the test rig within six minutes and 35 seconds from the start time. So that was that first row of thermocouples. Um, so that was terminated early. Remember the test itself has got to last for a full 30 minutes. It's then extinguished um, and the, it stands for a further 30 minutes to see if there's any secondary fires or any further uh, fire spread. So that's why the two pictures are probably a little bit counterintuitive, simply because the full scale test over here, which was carried out with the non-combustible products, shows a bit more damage, but it lasted the full duration of the fire and, and, and the fire did not spread beyond what you can see there. So it didn't go above the top of the test rig and it, it passed the actual criteria. So that was with test six was, was, was with the A2 product, the non-combustible, if you like, a limited combustible, ACM with stone wheel in the cavity. So this was a summary, if you like, of all seven tests that were carried out. As you can see, tests one, two and three were all terminated early because the flames extended above the top of the test rig within 30 minutes. The um, test two uh, with stone wool uh, and um, the, the polyethylene core very much performed very similar to the polyisurate foam insulation exposed behind the range screen cladding. Um, which just goes to show that the actual product itself, the pot, you know, the ACM with the polyethylene core, it's, it, it just bypasses, if you like, those compartment lines. And that's quite critical when it comes to vertical fire spread. The, the slightly more um, robust ACM cladding that has got the FR, so that's a slightly more if you like mineral content in it and it's called fire retardant FR um, with the PIR the polyisocyanurate foam it failed at 23 minutes 22 seconds into the test because again the flaming it was sustained up two meters if you like above the top of the test trick. We have passes with uh, test four five and six as you can see um, as we're moving towards a more non-combustible, if you like, um, performance criteria. So what's quite interesting about test number seven is, although it was very close to the 30 minute um, criteria for extinguishing the crib, the, the flames did go over the top of the test rig in two minutes, 26 minutes, sorry, um, and 19 seconds. Since those tests have been carried out, industry has performed their, their tests in UCAS accredited test houses and actually pass that. So it's, I think that just goes to show that small changes in the, say the gap sizes between panels or positioning of cavity banners, etc., does have a significant uh, impact, if you like, on the pass fail criteria. So it's really important to stress what is tested in the factory actually is what is constructed on site. The building research establishment shortly after, um, not long after the Grenfell fire, were asked to basically get permission, if you like, from industry to record 
all the systems, if you like, that have been achieved a BR135 classification. These are available online. I think there's about 55 in this particular, um, if you like, database that the BRE host. Um, there will be a lot more tests that, are, that have passed BR135 uh, that you'll be able to find online, but also if fire risk assessors or uh, even building standards officers are dealing with refurbishment jobs, if they ask for the performance criteria and the test results, they should be able to get them from industry. This is really important because it will identify how the system was tested, how it was constructed, how it was fixed, what the gaps are between the panels, the position of the cavity banners, etc, etc. And that is the key point that, that really needs to be uh, hammered home in terms of uh, compliance, if you like, with building regulations. So moving on to the European reaction to fire classifications, um, it was introduced in the, the building regulations of Scotland in the early 2000s. Um, as you can see from the slide there, A1 is best, that is in effect non-combustible, and F is the worst. I purposely put this slide on because we used to have this in uh, the technical handbooks and the building regulations. I, I do want to stress, however, that, that it's not a straight read across. So the British standard class is not, or the test, sorry, the test for British standards are not identical to the European. So you can't do a read across. It's an either a European test or a British standards test. Some products are obviously tested to both, but um, the two different tests, as I'll explain just in a, in, in a moment. Um, as you can see, A1, A2 at the, at the top level there, progressively reducing performance as we go down. Um, and I'll just explain that in, in a moment. Um, so, what is the non-combustibility test? I'm not going to go through all the technical details here in a moment, but if older buildings are tested to the previous, if you like, the British standards, it will be BS476 part, uh, part 4 and Part 11. Both those tests are almost identical, if you like, um, to, to, to this 1182 scenario. Um, so, five samples, a small product, very small, um, tested in a furnace, 750 degrees. Clearly, if the fire goes in the real world goes beyond 750 degrees, the, the, the product might perform slightly uh, worse. An awful lot of fires are below 750 degrees C. We, we get flash over between five, 600 degrees C-ish, maybe a bit higher. Um, so it's a very robust test. It's put in a furnace, pre-calibrated pre at 750 degrees C, and we, we measure the, the um, temperature rise, if you like, um, between the, the specimen and the and the actual furnace. So that's the three criteria that's measured. Is there any sustained flaming of the product? What is the mass loss of the product? And what is the increase in temperature? And again, the test lasts for at least 60 minutes. The additional test that's required for non-combustibility is the BSEN ISO 1716 test. Again, I'm not going to go through this in a huge amount of detail, but basically 0.5 grams um, of product is put, is ground, if you like, and it's put in the crucible here, dropped into the oxygen calorimetric bomb, which is then ultimately lowered, if you like, into the, into the actual vessel, which is an insulated vessel. Um, connected to ignition wires. There's a little stirrer there you can see, um, which which maintains the, um, if you like, the, the movement of the, of the of the water inside the the vessel, and there's a there's a thermometer. So as you can see from the slide there, it measures really the the, the, the heat going through the actual uh, water, and as a, as a result of that, there's a calculation, which which works out the calorific content in megajoules per kilogram or megajoules per metre squared. The single burning item test 
is a test which is designed primarily for wall and ceiling linings um, and it measures the flame spread, the heat release, the smoke production and the burning droplets. It replicates a small bin fire in the corner of a room, about 30 kilowatts. Um, as you can see, just about on the right hand side there, there's a trolley. So the specimen gets put in on the trolley and then it gets wheeled into position. As you can see, there's a it's a one meter, 1.5 meter high. Um, there's a return wing of 0 0.5 meters, half a meter, and the main wing is one meter. The Ignitability test is another test that's used in the classification system and it basically evaluates the ignitability of a product exposed to a small flame and that small being almost simulating a, a, a small match. The extent of burning time and flaming droplets are, are, are measured as you can see from the slide here, the filter paper uh, also, if it ignites, it, 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 that's part, that forms part of the test. If the edges of the specimen are exposed in end use conditions, the test says that it must be have the, the both the surface and the edge flame techs are, uh, attacks are applied to that particular test. The basic principle is that if the, if the flames spread up the, the specimen more than 150 millimetres, then that within a certain period of time, that will adjust to classification. That's the kind of principle. It's a very small um, scale test. I'll now just let you see it behind my... So it's about 250 millimetres high, 250 millimetres high by about uh, 90 millimetres wide is the test specimen. Again, I'm just going to skip through this because we're coming to the end. Um, what does all this mean? Basically, for the A1 classification, the temperature difference is less than or equal to 30 degrees C. And that's the furnace temperature. The mass loss is less than 50%. And there's no sustained flaming at all recorded on that specimen that's been tested in the non-combustible test. Equally, the bomb calorimeter, you can see it's very low in terms of the gross calorific value, less than two megajoules per kilogram. And when we move further on, again, you can see the figures have just slightly changed. Um, still a very robust test and a, a good, good performance in terms of the calorific value and the, the mass loss and the temperature rise, etc. Um, sustained flaming was less than 20 seconds. Um, for the for the A2 classification. There is an option, um, as you can see here from the, 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 the slide, that if it doesn't achieve, if, if the product does not achieve this criteria here, then it has to satisfy the, the, the bomb calorimeter test and this second test, which is the single burning item test that I just described a moment ago. I'll not go through all of those in any great detail, other than to say that's the fire growth, fire growth index. Uh, that is the lateral frame sped, if you like, lateral frame sped, and that is the total heat release rate at 600 seconds, less than five and, five and a half megajoules. And as you can see from the slide there, I, I know it's a little bit uh, technical, but you can see that the performance reduces um, as we go through as we go through the the, um, the test criteria so much so that at the bottom we have um, at the bottom you can see there that the ex the small flame exposure test there was flame spread greater than 150 millimeters within 20 seconds so that's that that is a quite a, a poor result um, so they're basically scenario tests. They're not really intended to simulate. So just a couple of slides to finish, really, uh, in terms of the British standard tests. Again, these tests are designed for internal wall and ceiling linings. But you may well uh, come across cladding system materials that have been tested to these uh, particular test standards, these scenario tests. So just to briefly explain to you, this is a, a large radiant panel of about 
850 millimetres square. We have a, a, a water cooled holder. Um, it's taken through 90 degrees. The sample is placed in that holder. The sample itself is about 885 millimetres by 270 millimetres in that holder. The six samples tested. The pilot burner is ignited uh, and the extinguished after one minute. And this is the pilot over here, as you can see. The radiance level of the heat at 75 millimetres from the face of that panel is 32.5 kilowatts per metre squared. That's 15 times the size of a two bar kilowatt fire, if you're old enough to remember. Um, and it, it's about 825 millimetres along the panel, um, say at this area here, it is five kilowatts per meter squared. So, it, so the idea is that you basically measure the flame spread across that panel. And you can see how the classification works. So class one, after you've got initial 1.5 minutes and then you have uh, 10 minutes. And as you can see, class one, less than 135, sorry, 165 millimeters. And, and, and again, the performance criteria um, basically class one best down to class four. So you can see there the, the, the actual the limit of the flame spread um, and it reduces obviously the further down you, you go for the classes. But bearing in mind that that test is designed primarily for internal wall and ceiling linings with that scenario, it will still give you a, a good idea of the performance of the material. I'll not go into par six in any detail, but I was just wanting to show you this one because it, it's a small, again, it's a small scale test, 225 millimetres by 225 millimetres uh, sample gets put in the, the um, holder here, again, gets lifted up into position. There's, it measures heat release rate um, and the ignition characteristics of the actual product. So the big eye is related to the heat release rate and the small eye is related to the ignition characteristics. And you can see there's three samples tested at 10, 3, 10 and 20 minutes. And some indices are recorded. Again, I'll not go into this in any huge detail. But you will come across a product called class O. What does that actually mean? So basically class one surface spread of flame achieves a class one and the fire propagation index, the heat release rate I not more than 12 and the sub index I1, that's the ignition characteristics not more than six when testing in accordance with part six. Basically all that means is that it's quite a good product for those particular scenarios. So class O is the best so the lower the, the, the numbers and so the lower the numbers here and here, the better. Um, the higher the numbers, the, the product does not perform as well. So just to summarize, um, fire tests are laboratory controlled tests, as we know. They're, they're scenario tests dealing with particular types of heating regimes. They're not intended to simulate um, real fires which are so multivariant in nature. We also know that fires rarely spread beyond the floor of origin in less, you know, we're talking about in less than 1% of cases. And in Scotland, we've had no fatalities um, recorded beyond the dwelling of origin since the early 2000s, when the statistics were transferred, if you like, from the Home Office to the Scottish Government, um, and possibly even earlier. Having said all that, of course, we're not complacent. Grenfell fire was a horrific tragedy, which clearly reinforces what can go wrong uh, at an extreme level, and it's had absolute global impact. We, the key point really is that fire safety needs to be dealt with in a holistic sense Cladding is only one small part of that, and it's worth bearing that in mind to, when, you, when fire risk assessors or specialist uh, assessors carrying out intrusive surveys or whatever, 
is happening, it's really important that that's put into context in terms of the holistic approach to, to fire safety. Um, buildings may have sprinklers, there may be um, cladding panels that are combustible at low level, and because of what Gavin explained earlier on about the accessibility in terms of the fire service to get a water jet on low rise buildings, that all should feature within the, within the, the if you like, the risk assessment. So the, the flammability of the material is just, is just one part of the problem. Um, we know that we've had a, a large scale facade test developed since the late 1980s, and it continues to evolve and the robustness continues to improve. BSI have just recently conducted a review uh, and they'll be looking at further reviews involving, in, including the BR135 performance criteria. So it will, it will evolve. The European uh, Commission are also let a contract and they are looking at a large scale and intermediate scale facade test. They're basing the initial um, findings of their research, they're basing the, the, uh, the work that they've been doing on um, the large scale test to BS8414 that's used in the UK and indeed Australia, um, but they're also going to be looking at an intermediate scale test as well. There may well be some evolutions as regards windows, etc. But it's important that, that we need to look at the whole, whole what is it we're trying to achieve what is scenario. To achieve and, um, scenario. And I keep going back to this reference case scenario where you've got a complete non-combustible building. What is it we're actually trying to achieve? Building regulations and guidance will evolve, but it's really important that I think that the assessment of fire risk is put into context. And uh, I hope that this short presentation has given you some kind of, uh, hopefully a degree of comfort. Uh, if not, I'm more than happy to take questions and um, emails, etc. We'll be able to share our details. And uh, yeah, so I'll look forward to our continued conversation on this. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, look forward to the Q&A session. Another hugely informative and detailed presentation. Thanks, Colin. Uh, fascinating to see the amount of different fire testing that goes on across the industry. I hope these presentations have helped answer some of your questions you may have had, uh, but obviously appreciate they're likely to be more specific questions for our panelists. We have therefore allowed uh, some time for a Q&A session, so please make sure you submit uh, the questions via the control panel. Uh, but before we kick that off, um, we'd just like to pose one final question to the audience members. So if we could have our third poll, please. Do you agree there is a need for the Scottish advice? No. Yes, no, or don't know. Well, a resounding uh, yes there, absolutely nothing for the no's, um, small 5% on the don't no's. So as I said, we'll, we'll incorporate this into the other um, results from the webinars, um, and I suspect we'll, we'll, we'll have some information out following these. Um, okay, so let, we'll, we'll, we've, we've had plenty of questions coming in. Um, the first question um, we've got from is uh, from Anthony, um, and now I just need to find it. Uh, the Scottish advice note seems to place the responsibility on the shoulders of the fire safety risk assessors and not the fire engineers. Why is that? And if they're not one and the same person, how can these people cooperate? Who has primacy? Whose professional opinion counts the most? Uh, Gavin, perhaps you, could, uh, perhaps you could offer some insight into that. Yeah, thanks, Sam, and thanks, Anthony, for the question. Apologies um, that you can't see me. That's actually a blessing, believe me. Um, but we've got some technical difficulties with my uh, laptop camera. Uh, it's incompatible. Um, so to come to the question, the, the SAN fills a gap in existing fire safety risk assessment guidance. Um, and so the, the principles of risk assessment underpin the SAN. Um, and also, a, a risk-based approach was the, the clear consensus of the, the technical working group um, that came together on, on three occasions to, to draft the, the SAN uh, and to agree this, this draft version that's out for consultation just now. 
But to come to your, your point more directly, I don't know if you remember the diagram um, that I put up showing the relationship between the fire risk assessor and other types of specialists. Um, the input from specialists are always required in risk assessments because the risk assessors themselves are not normally also qualified electricians or qualified gas engineers or structural engineers. Um, and similarly, intrusive um, external wall appraisal, if it's required, is, is likely to require that specialist input uh, to take samples and to undertake fire performance testing um, of the type that, that Colin's been talking about. So th the roles are really complementary. Um, one informs the other, uh, rather than being set against each other. Uh, what we'd say, of course, for, for non-domestic residential premises, um, such as hotels, hospitals, etc., fire safety legislation requires that duty holders ensure all fire hazards, including the fire spread on external walls, is considered in the fire safety risk assessment. So the risk assessment needs to take account of all relevant information, um, such as an engineer's external wall appraisal report, just as they would have to for the gas or electrician uh, engineer's report or a fire engineering report or a structural engineering report. So I hope that explains the, the relationship between the, the different uh, specialisms and the risk assessor. That's, uh, yeah, that's great. Thanks, Gavin. Um, okay, next question um, is from Tom. Um, and probably one for you, Colin. Could you talk about the comment um, of the over-provision of cavity barriers? Um, and perhaps for, for the novices out there, what uh, what they mean by over-provision um, and what it is that exactly that you're considering? Uh, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Um, thanks, Tom. I think that's an excellent question. You'll recall from my presentation earlier, um, in one of the slides where I showed you the little yellow kind of ribbon below the thermocouples on that particular, um, the large scale test, if you like. Basically, what we, it is a good question because you can strategically locate those cavity barriers below the thermocouples to circumvent a, a result of a test. That's all fine and dandy. I've got no problem with that. The only question is that the provision of those cavity banners should then be how they were tested in the factory, how they then go on site. So it's really quite important that the system that's tested actually replicates what is what is in place on site. So if it's an X number of distance above the, the chamber, then then that's where the, the cavity barrier should be in that system test, etc. So um, I think it's quite an important question, and um, yeah, uh, I, I totally agree with it. I, I have to say that the British Standards Institution have in recently tightened up on this very question about uh, the, the latest British Standard BS 8414 is 2020 editions now being published, and they have tightened up on this question about declarations of what, what's designed is actually installed uh, and then what has been tested. So there, there has been a bit of tightening up on that. I have to say it's no different than I suppose any other tests. For example, the single burning item test, how, how the product's mounted on that test, uh, again, is, is how it should be in end use conditions. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a very good question, but, but um, I think if there's over provision on, on site compared to what was factory tested, that is less of a problem. It's more, it's more the opposite. Um, so if there's definitely more provision of cavity barriers on site than what's been tested, I don't see a huge problem with that. Okay, great, Colin. And, uh, and, and continuing, continuing on that theme, um, with a question asking if we could explain why the criteria is set 600 degrees C. Um, I'm assuming that's the thermocouplers, but actually you'll probably know better than me. Uh, is it glass failure temperature or something else? Yeah, it's. It's a fairly arbitrary number, but it was it was selected, uh, you know, for a particular purpose. And if I just try and explain that the, the temperature of 600 degrees C is at, the, at that second row of thermocouples. So if you remember from my presentation, the start time is, is, is level one uh, row of thermocouples, 200 degrees C. Now, what, what, what wasn't clear in my presentation is there's three banks of, of thermocouples, one poking out through the product, one in the cavity, and one actually in the insulation as well. So there's, there's three, if you like, banks of thermocouples at each level, three, three at level one and, and three at level level two. 
Um, so the 600 degrees C flash over generally happens between 500 and 600 degrees C. So that's one of the, the, the key reasons that that, that number was, was chosen. Um, I should point out that glass itself, because I know the question was related to glass, glass itself can fail at, at lower temperatures and than, than, uh, than that, a lot lower temperatures. Um, but you can get fire resistant glass on the market as well. So you have to be aware of the, the different glazing systems will perform differently in, in, in fire conditions. But um, so I suppose the only other thing I would say is the, in terms of the context and all of this, and I can't emphasize this enough, less than 1% of accidental dwelling fires actually spread beyond the floor of origin. And I think it's important to remember that most accidental dwelling fires are contained to the item first ignited, the, the sofa, the bed, the, 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 whatever that item is first ignited, then the room of origin, then the dwelling of origin, and then very rarely do we get flash over and spread onto the external wall. So it is in a that less than 1% of accidental dwelling fires, that's the kind of space that we're working in with this post flashover fire for that particular scenario. Um, it's also worth pointing out, I suppose, that the non-combustibility test, as, as you know, the, the furnace, the little furnace was set, you know, is, is seven, pre preheated at 750 degrees C as well. And as we all know, fires can get, you know, beyond that temperature as well. So. It's just, it, they're, they're, they're not real, they're, it's difficult to, to talk about realistic versus um, real world fires. I suppose BS8 over 14 is attempting to deal with a post flash over fire. Um, and the non combustibility test is also dealing with a post flash over fire, but it's a lot smaller scale, obviously. Um, but you can get temperatures that, that, that exceed that as well. So, and equally, most fires are tend to be quite small, so your fire curve is going to be a lot lower temperatures, and and that the test, you know, the, the products will perform particularly well. But so we're trying to make it as as, as robust a test as possible with the temperatures that are as high as possible and flashover as as um, you know as is kind of that's the, that's the average temperature of flashover, 500 to 600 degrees C. Okay, great. Thanks, Colin. Um, we've got a, a question here from Bruce. Um, what? is the view on desktop evaluations by specialist labs, EEG, uh, Exova, where elements have been substituted as part of the overall test assembly. Grenfell inquiry has recently raised this issue. Um, probably, probably Colin, um, across to you again for this. Yeah, basically, the, 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 again, the British Standards Institution have recently published a uh, if you like a set of rules round about what they call extended field of application, which is which is another rule. I don't like the word desktop studies because it kind of suggests that there's been no degree of, you know, a scrutiny in terms of its performance in a fire test, etc. So you can get um, some assessments, if you like, based on one test. You could get a series of products and systems tested to, to, two, to two series of tests. So for example, at one end of the spectrum, you've got manufacturers who will design a system that is performance is at the lower end of the test results, and you'll have it at the higher end. And then you could interpolate those results in between those two set, sets of parameters, if you follow what I'm saying. So that would be uh, an appropriate use of what I would call direct field of application, where you've got BS8414 test results. The, the rules in 8414, they are quite restrictive at the moment. They are quite, um, the, 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 there's not a lot of room for wriggle room, shall we say, within the BS8414. So, for, so in the back, the question, the question is absolutely spot on, and it is, a lot of this came on the back of the Dame Judith Hackett question as well, and, and her criticisms, that, that, that there needed to be a tightening up of desktop studies throughout the UK and certainly BS8414 is, is, is a good step forward in, in, in that regard. So um, yeah, it's, 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 it's something that has to be based on test evidence, I think is the key point. Okay, great. Um, I'm conscious that we've had, uh, we've had a number of questions in around the, the ESW1 form. Um, 
uh, and it's probably simplest to say that the Scottish Government have set up a, a specific ministerial working group to look into this subject and are obviously keen to, to resolve any lending, lending issues with the UK Government. Um, we have got, a, 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 yeah, we've probably had two or three um, different questions regarding that and I think, uh, it, yeah, that's probably the safest thing to say on that. Um, yeah, I, I think just to just to back up on that, it's, there is a separate ministerial working group chaired by Kevin Stewart, the Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, and he is they are specifically looking at all those issues round about uh, mortgage lending, ESW one forms, the competency agenda, insurance uh, capacity, uh, competence, all of these things that are certainly in the mix and, and really trying to to get a four nations approach because it's. As a lot of people in the audience are probably not aware, um, mortgage lending is actually reserved to the Westminster government. So the Scottish government have been have been pushing really hard to try and get, um, a, you know, a kind of UK wide approach to all of this and, and try and get this moving this whole agenda moving forward a lot quicker. Great. Okay. Thanks, Colin. Okay, that's probably um, that's probably everything we've got time for um, to wrap up today's session. Um, I'd first like to thank you, obviously the audience, for, for taking time to join us today and for all these um, important questions. I'd also like to thank our panelists, Gavin uh, and Colin, for sharing their presentations and valuable knowledge. Uh, we really hope you found the sessions useful. There have been a lot of questions submitted, um, and, and obviously we haven't been able to get to all of them. However, um, CSIC and, and Scottish Government will endeavour to get them answered um, either within the next set of webinars or through some follow-up communications. Um, your feedback is used to plan future events and initiatives, so please do complete the feedback form you'll receive following this event. And finally, please see the links in the chat function for related sites um, and to stay up to date with the latest state of the art you can contact each of the organisations through these links for further information or references if required. And follow us, obviously, on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, etc. So that just leaves me to say thank you, everybody, for attending today. And we look forward to welcoming you at our, our next event. Good afternoon.